Today, our annual meeting will be a mix of presentation and conversation, beginning with a more traditional annual meeting report format and then opening up to a discussion with our community. Before we begin, I wanted to point out a few of the logistical aspects of our meeting on Zoom. You'll see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free at any time during the presentation to type in a question. After the presentations conclude, Sylvia and Shamim will come back on screen with me, along with our Director of Finance, Jisuk Kutz, who will moderate the Q&A to begin our conversation. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Henry Art Gallery is located on the historic and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot Nations, and other Coast Salish peoples who call the waters and coasts of the Salish Sea home. We invite you to join with us in this acknowledgement and to reflect upon this context during your time with us. It is truly an honor for me to kick off today's Henry Gallery public meeting. It is an honor and it is humbling. That humility I think is derived from a few sources. It is derived from the presence of so many of you here with us today. It's derived from the enormous and heartfelt work that the Henry Board does to support the mission of this truly meaningful institution. And it comes from seeing how very tirelessly the staff of the Henry works day after day, week after week, and month after month in the very real pursuit of that mission to engage all people in the transformative power of contemporary art and ideas. Working more closely with Henry staff than ever before, the board has been making progress against a new strategic plan. Centered in this work are our values, collaboration, taking risks, accountability, openness to uncertain outcomes, innovation and discovery, racial equity and social justice, and inclusivity. We've been both careful and collaborative with the staff in planning and oversight. For over five years, the Henry staff and board have actively engaged the work of addressing equity at all levels of the organization. We have more to do, but we've made real progress throughout as we work to be a more equitable and anti-racist organization. And for all of that, for me here today, the greatest dose of humility comes from reflecting on the responsibility that we feel as part of a cultural institution operating in this moment. I know I speak for many or all of us when I say that the past few weeks have required a great deal of listening, learning, and personal reflection on the role that I and that we have historically and in this moment have of upholding systems of power that oppress people of color and especially black people in our community. That work must necessarily extend to the work that we do on behalf of the Henry and that more than anything in this moment is humbling. It's humbling and it's inspiring for we are in a moment of great transformation and with that comes hope. I can think of nothing better in this moment than transformation and hope and would expect no less from an organization that opens our eyes and our minds to new voices and new ways of seeing the world around us every time we walk through its doors. So thank you for joining us today. We look forward to sharing our work with you and to addressing your questions at the end of the presentation. And now I'll turn it over to Sylvia Wolf the John S. Benke Director of the Henry. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I just want to double check that uh, the sound is, is working on my end. Okay. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for joining us on this gorgeous afternoon and coming together to hear more about what the Henry does. This year, we recognize that there's nothing ordinary about this time. As we take a moment to pause and review the last 12 months, we acknowledge that our world is in a time of transformative change. We have many questions as we realign our work during a global pandemic and ask ourselves what we need to do to become a more anti-racist organization. At this time of year last year, we launched a new strategic plan with a revised mission to engage all people in the transformative power of contemporary art and ideas. We aligned our work around four strategic goals, center art and artists, empower diverse voices and ideas, activate the Henry as a vibrant destination, and engage and expand our audiences. Central to each aspect of our strategic plan and embedded in each one of these goals was our commitment to equity. During the last, or sorry, during the first eight months of the fiscal year, there were many accomplishments and bright spots in art, audience engagement, UW and community outreach and staff and board development 
Shamim M. Momin's exhibition in plain sight opened with 14 artists spanning the museum, including new commissions, and you'll hear more about that shortly. But then we closed our doors on March 9th when coronavirus infections began to escalate in Seattle and the University of Washington moved to remote work and learning. Since then, the Henry staff has been working from home with some essential personnel ensuring the safety of the building and the art within. After the museum's closure to the public, we launched a suite of digital offerings to provide our global community with continued access to our collections, exhibitions, and artists. Uh, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, hashtag Henry at Home offers interviews with artists in our exhibitions, as well as virtual tours, stories, highlighting objects in our collection, and activities for families to make art at home. We continued our commitment to the creative community and are grateful for the flexibility and inventiveness of the artists with whom we contracted. They were incredible. They worked with us closely trying to figure out alternative ways to engage with our communities. And it reminded me just how much I love Seattle, a place that rolls up its sleeve, the can-do attitude of, well, if this is where we are, where are we going to go together? It's incredibly inspiring. Our members, our supporters, our friends reached out with generosity. Our city, our country, our, our state government and representatives and community, community organizations such as Arts Fund, the TEW Foundation, Seattle Ar Office of Arts and Culture, Chamber of Commerce were all swift and impactful with their support and their relief efforts. We applied for and received relief funds from the Federal Government CARES Act Paycheck Protection Plan, AKA PPP. And thanks to the above, we've been able to keep our Henry staff intact. Prioritizing our people, along with centering artists and audiences are values we hold dear. So too is our commitment to racial equity and social justice. Over the past five years, we've been in dialogue across the organization about what equity means to us. We have worked towards developing knowledge and a common vocabulary around diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. During the past two years, we have worked with our colleagues across the University of Washington's College of Arts and Sciences, learning from each other as we strive to become better stewards of the Henry and more aware citizens of the world. However, the brutal murder of George Floyd by white law enforcement one month ago today, and the racial reckoning that has followed in our country and beyond, along with the conversations we've been having within the Henry, make it abundantly clear that our work to date is not enough. We stand in solidarity with black and brown artists, colleagues, community members in the Black Lives Matter movement. We know we must deepen our commitment to confronting overt and systemic racism. We must more actively support the shifting of power from those who have benefited from structures of racism to those that have been oppressed by the cultural climate and practices within the art world and by institutional racism in general. We acknowledge our failings and we recognize that there is much more work to be done. Right now, we're taking the time to listen and reflect on what we can do to become a more anti-racist organization. We are looking inward to assess how racist systems play out within our own organization we are also taking steps to affect structural and systemic change. We are renewing our efforts to diversify staff, management, and board governance to represent our region. We will also continue to diversify programming to amplify the voices and views of many and to celebrate art in a broad variety of forms. Being committed to racial equity and social justice though, means continuing to review and revise our personnel policies, hiring practices, as well as professional development offerings and so much more. It is imperative that we develop methods and means to measure our progress to hold ourselves accountable. We know we won't be able to do everything at once. And we also know that we will have to create a timeline and benchmarks to adjust and add to them as we learn and we grow. We will do this. We believe in the power of the art and its role in propelling transformative societal change. 
And as we renew our focus on empowering artists of color, women, non-binary artists to cultivate new work, we thank the artists, the educators, the partners and the audiences who join us in this crucial work. Now I'm gonna step back, introduce Shamim M. Molman, Senior Curator, who will be joined by Dr. Mita Mihado, Associate Curator of Public and Youth Programs. And then I'll return for a few more re remarks before opening the floor to questions. Thank you again for being with us, Shamim. Thanks so much, Sylvia. And um, thank you to all who are joining. Again, I reiterate uh, foregoing this beautiful afternoon, so rare here. Um, I thought I might start actually by just by reviewing a bit of our exhibition history from this past year. Uh, so this past fiscal year, in fact, so that will be summer. I'll start with the, the suite of shows that we presented in the summer into fall. Um, I'm putting them all together in part because uh, I'd like you to see them all together. I'll, I'll touch back on that at the end, but um, I'd first like to mention um, our presentation of the Cecilia Bacuna exhibition about to happen which is the first major US solo exhibition of this incredibly influential Chilean born artist, uh, which traced her career long commitment to exploring the discarded, to exploring discarded and displaced materials, peoples and landscapes in a time of global climate change. So reframing this notion of dematerialization as both a formal consequence of 1960s conceptualism, but at the same time as radical uh, around radical climate change, it, it becomes so much about how to personalize that concept and how to make that about people and not purely an ideological perspective. The exhibition goes on to examine a kind of process that shapes public memory and our, our responsibility and complicity within that. So uh, you'll, you can see a, a one view of that. I hope many of you were able to see it. It was extraordinary and very difficult to capture in a single slide as with all of these. Um, at the same time, we had an exhibition of um, Kerry Yamaoka, who's been exhibiting her work since the 1980s, but um, we feel was quite under-recognized for her contribution. So this was actually the first solo museum presentation at all of this uh, amazing artist. And um, it was entitled Recto Verso, thinking about notions of visibility and representation and our renewed attention to the, the criticality of that. Uh, she currently lives and works in New York, and in addition to her solo works, you may know her as well as a founding member of the queer art collective Fierce Pussy. Across her work, Yamaoka revels in materiality. You can see that a little bit in the slides. I hope you're getting some sense of that texture. Um, and deploys strategies that mirror the, co the conception of the self and identity that is contingent and elastic, ever-changing, never stop. Her working methods embrace the instance of chance, states of transformation, and the indeterminate. And many of these artworks um, are from the, were from the early 1990s and can also be understood in relation to their time and the crucible at that moment of identity politics, the instability of language and representation, and the AIDS epidemic, a moment very present in the work, but as with so much art, continue to poignantly resonate today. The third exhibition um, I'll point out was uh, a presentation of Beverly Sims, a sculptor, though her practice also incorporates painting, photography, and performance. Um, this, which all kind of can converge or can hear together um, in ways to probe the paradoxes and complexities of the female body and its representation primarily. Um, you may know her work primarily from these large scale dress sculptures one of which you see here in the image uh, that actually has um, joined the Henry's collection as we wanted to uh, be able to celebrate that moment but at the same time worked with the artists who created four new paintings two of which you can see in the slide there um, as part of her uh, ongoing feminist responsibility project so it was an exciting moment to both think about how um, our new acquisitions and how this is becoming a part of our institutional collection but also work very directly with the artist commission so uh, <clears throat> next slide, please, Stephanie. From there, as Sylvia mentioned, we moved on to uh, the next exhibition, which is still there, it's not on view at the moment, called In Plain Sight, uh, which opened in late fall and was intended to run through late spring, early summer. Uh, so a full museum exhibition is a full museum exhibition, a group 
show that engages artists whose work addresses narratives, communities, and histories that are typically hidden or invisible in our public space, and that's both conceptually and literally defined in terms of space. The presenting artists approach the exhibition theme from a range of directions across all media, as well as different kinds of aesthetic and conceptual um, contexts, essentially. Um, there's everything from a kind of deliberately activist endeavor, direct documentation, uh, work that is deliberately, uh, sorry, excuse me, unpacking individual histories that have been excluded from our public narrative due to race, ethnicity, or class. Explorations of coded language that was necessitated by a need for secrecy or self-protection within communities, as well as the illumination of invisible or covert systems of labor exploitation and capitalist control. So it's a, it's a, that I know that encompasses a lot, but it's a big exhibition. And it occupies the entire museum, and um, fundamentally, all of these artists are really questioning the notion of what we've previously perceived or been presented with a complete authoritative story of truth of some kind, where wherein this needs to be expanded, retold, and in, inviting multiple voices, multiple truths and really trying to embrace the true complexity of humanness with all of its complications and inequities within. Um, so we also planned a series of public programs throughout the course of this fairly long exhibition in order to be able to activate it directly with artists and other of our community partners throughout. Um, unfortunately, of course, some of that had to come to a stop at the beginning of March when we did close. And um, like everyone else, we had to do a very quick and very deep pivot to what we could offer our artists remotely, uh, sorry, our audience remotely through um, our various digital platforms. And I do want to take one second to thank the entire team across multiple departments who suddenly needed to be working in a very different way than we were previously used to, thinking about the remote virtual space and suddenly our exhibition space, our space for content and for programmatic communication. We really did so with such grace and inventiveness and creativity and dedication. I hope some of you have been um, taking advantage of the offerings that have been out there. Really, we tried uh, our best to think about a multiplicity of types, of styles, of formats, um, being able to present past programming as well, bring some of that back into, um, <clears throat> into our offerings and, uh, and give some sense of the breadth and diversity of our virtual programs as well as move into new programs or re reconfigure programming that we had planned so we could, to the best of our ability, maintain the commitments that we have to the artists um, in this show as well as beyond within our, um, our programmatic strategy. So because so much of that actually is programmatic and around events, actually this is a good moment for me to um, uh, turn this over to Nita. And she'll talk a bit more about our public programs overall, both before and then after the closure. And then I'll come back and chat a bit about our upcoming uh, exhibitions and everything. So thank you. Thanks, Shamim. Uh, as you all might imagine, all of the exhibition content that we've had this past year provided a lot of inspiration to develop a number of programs. And what you're seeing here on the slide are just a few of many. Um, rather than going through event by event, I thought it would be instructive to provide an overview of our general approach to toward program development with a couple specific examples. And then I'll also share how this approach has helped guide us as we move to distance programming uh, in response to COVID and how it continues to guide us as we look ahead to this upcoming year. Uh, basically, we've been working to build more sustained and thoughtful community engagement so that we don't think of our programs as, as singular events, but as opportunities for ongoing and deepening conversations with our exhibiting artists and our community partners. And that includes local organizations, local artists, University of Washington, faculty, staff, students, student groups, as well as youth communities and families. And we're really looking at how we can facilitate and cultivate ongoing conversations that become the basis for programs rather than the other way around where we might come up with a program and then find somebody to work 
work with. Uh, so ideally, these are programs that are emerging from community needs and interests and also work in support of the creative practice of our artist partners. With Art Ventures, our monthly family program, we've shifted this year to a model in which we invite a different local artist each month to design and facilitate an activity that would support their work and also engage with community issues and exhibition content. Uh, the image featured on the slide is from our February art venture with artist Juliana King Robinson and this particular activity asked families to reflect on arts capacity to create an atmosphere of welcome and inclusion. Uh, Juliana was specifically reflecting on Seattle's status as a sanctuary city in face of federal anti immigrant policy and sentiment. Uh, another example, last fall, we partnered with Portland-based artist Takahiro Yamamoto in the development of his performance, Property of Opaqueness. Uh, the University of Washington Dance Department and Velocity Dance Center provided rehearsal space. Velocity also hosted the performance as well as partnered closely on program development, which included a discussion group that took place at the Henry uh, within the Carrie Yamaoka Recto Verso exhibition and that discussion group engaged uh, her work as well. Uh, so that should provide some sense of the rich web of conversations that went into this collaboration. I think it's worth noting that as we've shifted to online programs, this collaboration has found new life with the development of an online discussion seminar uh, involving Velocity and On the Boards. Um, on the Boards was partnering with, with uh, Yamamoto on a performance that was to take place in June, and we all put our heads together to think of ways to support on the boards as well as Yamamoto's creative practice during the postponement of the program. Uh, next slide, Dustin. So using that as a jumping off point, the restrictions that COVID-19 placed on our ability to gather safely asked us to be flexible and imaginative with our offerings. Uh, many of our scheduled programs were either postponed or reshaped to suit an online format. Uh, included in this reshaping was the In Plain Sight film series, a collaboration with Northwest Film Forum that we had been working on uh, for some time. And uh, with the shift to online screenings, we actually ended up expanding the program and included three additional engagements, which opened opportunity for new partnerships, as well as the building of a great deal of excitement uh, looking ahead to future programs with um, existing partners, including Northwest Film Forum and also the Black Cinema Collective. For Art Ventures, we invited our teaching artists to create short videos for families at home. So we made potato stamps, we made uh, painted fabrics using old candles as dye resist, um, and a bunch of other activities. And it's actually been a really rich uh, time to work with our partners and to support each other and share resources and to think expansively and inventively about our offerings. Uh, in terms of scheduling, in terms of the platforms we're using, in terms of audience engagement, uh, and in terms of how we can best support the artists that work with us given their varying capacities and needs during this time. And uh, one of the things that we're really excited about is approaching this way of working together collectively and experimentally as a model for us moving forward and not just in response to our current times. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back to Shamim who will share some of what is upcoming. Shamim, you're muted. I'm sorry, excuse me. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you so much, Mina. Um, so looking ahead towards the fall, we are still uncertain exactly when that will be, or when that will begin, I suppose I should say. Um, but we remain committed to the plan that we have put to place, which is to participate in uh, a nationwide uh, initiative called the Feminist Art Coalition, FAC, for short. I mean, this was a sort of organically evolved uh, group of curators and other organizational colleagues um, who wanted to create a platform for art projects informed by feminism, specifically plural, to invest the many approaches, to address the many approaches that one might house under that particular rubric. And overall, the FAC seeks to generate cultural awareness of feminist thought, experience, and action. 
But the intent is also to foster collaborations between art institutions, and that's part of the reason it became a nationwide initiative. Right now, there are over 100 participating organizations, it's pretty extraordinary, um, that aim to make public their commitment to social justice and cultural change and really put it into effect together and see where that kind of multiplicative uh, uh, connection can happen. Um, so we, as, as mentioned, um, we have maintained our commitment to that participation. The Henry decided as a team that we wanted to dedicate our entire footprint um, to this initiative. So some folks are, do everybody's doing things in different ways in exhibition of program, multiple uh, formats. Um, we are putting the entire museum and programmatic schedule towards the FAC concept. Um, that will be comprised of six exhibitions. Uh, we did have to shift some things in terms of scheduling, but again, we've canceled nothing. Everything is maintained throughout the whole schedule, but we shifted some exhibitions in response to artist requests and what could be possible within the limitations that we have in order to best support their vision. Um, so for this upcoming suite of shows, um, I'm just gonna mention them quickly. I'll try to give a little bit of a description so you get a sense of the, the breadth of the approach. Um, but among those six exhibitions are um, a experimental essay film by an artist collective or co uh, called Ben Bitchell. Um, it's a collaboration between Charlene Van Boat and uh, Alexis Mitchell. And this kind of single channel film along with the architectural installation that uh, creates the site from which you view it poses questions about the administration of justice and rights. Um, under the law via a kind of absurdist narrative of the justice system that is all too resonant, ever more resonant today. Um, we, in, in conjunction with that, and I don't have an image of this, but I do want to riff off what Mita was talking about. Um, we've been planning a, a major colloquium, the Bugs and Beasts Before the Law Colloquium, um, that would imagine and explore possibilities for survival and liberation for those whose protections are limited or whose personhood is compromised or oppressed or threatened within the so within sociological systems. So again, inspired by the film, but a multidisciplinary colloquium that brought that will be bringing in in various ways, scholars, thinkers, way, ped pedagogical advancements, ways of thinking, and artists, of course, um, throughout a course of initially planned as, as a several day symposium. Now we've shifted and Nita and Nina Bozichnik, who's the curator of the Ben Mitchell exhibition, are working around a very flexible concept of multiple sites, multiple time frames across um, different modes of interaction and as well as ways to collect that information and present it. So um, just another version of how we're trying to work with the constraints we have but take them as potentially a way to think through new ways of thinking new ways of working this will allow perhaps even broader range of folks to participate and ideas to, to come around that so um uh, other shows that you see up here images math bass um is an artist who um who from whom we've commissioned uh, an exhibition that will take place in the galleries as well as externally around the around the museum and the plaza which we're excited about to be able to extend beyond the walls here uh, something i hope we'll be able to continue ongoing um, matt's work tends fundamentally is really about control about openness uh, control and openness essentially intention both around the body and architecture and how those uh, experiences interact and done through a kind of abstract graphic language. This will come, this exhibition will be comprised of paintings, um, a, a kinetic wall sculpture, as well as the aforementioned uh, external installation that, that I hope you'll all be able to see um, in this upcoming fall. Um, then we have two exhibitions that are drawn or based on our permanent collection, but again, read through this lens of the Feminist Art Coalition. Um, illustrating injustices highlights the power of printed material to communicate social and systemic injustices and features work um, in concert by the French lithographer Honoré Daumier in concert with American photographer Danny Lyons. So an interesting connection um, that pulls forward uh, notions around justice again and, the, and injustice essentially through uh, those systems and procedures but via uh, material that is widely disseminated and thought of as a kind of more populist approach. Um, 
So we also have plural possibilities, which again is also is based on the Henders collection. Um, I think the full title is still plural possibilities of the female body. So you might um, guess from that that we're thinking about um, gendered representation, ideas around uh, uh, the gaze and the vision of how women are envisioned in both the world and taken back that vision and used that in their work. Um, so that will be primarily a relatively contemporary selection of, I want to say it was like around 23 artists at this time, but it's still in progress. Um, and lastly, I just would say that while we do not have um, the final dates for in plain sight, or, I'm sorry, for our reopening, we are hoping to, to welcome you back for that moment. Um, and hopefully those of you who have, um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Those of you who have not seen the show, I hope you'll be able to join us there because like most art, it resonates in a different way at different times. Um, I, from the thematic, we are really trying, the artists involved are thinking about um, hidden histories, unspoken systems, things we need to address, rectify, make better. And um, it takes on a new resonance, frankly, much of the work and the artist vision in this world, in this context, um, how we might take that dialogue and re-envision a world um, against these brutal injustices that we see and how we might make one better and more humane. So um, I do hope to see you all there then and we'll let you know as soon as we can if we are able to reopen with that soon. So I will stop, sorry, I'm sure I've gone over again as always, but I will return this back to Sylvia for a couple of remarks and look forward to our question and answer section as well. Thank you, Shameen. And thank you, Mita. Um, as we look to the future, we're making plans to reopen, as Shami mentioned, when Governor Inslee announces that King County has entered phase three. As you know, we entered phase two last Friday. Uh, and as soon as we have safety measures in place to make sure we can ensure that the health and well being of our staff and visitors is uh, taken care of. Right now, it may be sometime in August, but again, the numbers in the past few days, we really, none of us know where we are headed. Um, all will depend upon the recommendations by government and health uh, officials and safety and well-being. In the meantime, we're working hard to prepare to welcome you back, uh, to bring new art and artistic perspectives to our region in the fall. We're working across the organization di discussing departmental specific pathways to realizing being an anti-racist organization. And there are more and more and more things that I'm happy to talk about a little bit more in the chat function, or sorry, in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, I will say that the board just approved our FY21 budget, which, keep, which keeps all staff on the payroll. And we will have some open positions that we'll be posting shortly. Um, we're also looking at what additional resources that Henry needs to advance this work. Uh, we know there's much, much more to do. At this time of loss, at this time of uncertainty and grief, as we are in a global pandemic with more than 121,000 dead and with a disproportionate number of those deaths in the black community and among those without access to adequate healthcare or services, as the disparate impacts of the economic fallout shines light on systemic and structural racism in our country, the strength of the Seattle community, of the art community, of the artist community, of our community has been one of the bright spots that has given me hope. University leadership, the Henry Borden staff, our friends and partners have been foundational in their support. Our Henry team inspires me every day with their resilience, creativity, unwavering commitment to our vision of a world where art leads everyone to discover new possibilities in themselves, others, and the world around them. And to all of you who have served and contributed to the Henry over the years and have been part of its growth and development, I'm deeply grateful for the strong foundation your support has provided that we stand on now. I'm confident that Team Henry and our stakeholders will continue to respond to rapid changes in our world with the nimbleness and commitment to innovation that has been integral to our long history of connecting audiences with contemporary art, artists, and ideas. And with that, 
I'll invite Jisoo Kutz, our Director of Finance and Administration, to join us. Jisoo will serve as our moderator during the Q&A. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, if you have any questions, we invite you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and uh, we'll address those questions as they come in. Perhaps we can start with a question that came in already. Um, and one of those questions was if we can talk about, the Henry can talk about um, our institutional self-reflections at this time and how we're moving forward with that. Yes, thank you. Uh, you know, I think it's a time of institutional self-reflection, individual self-reflection, and a lot of conversation. Um, we're talking in small groups and department groups, but I think the institution is also looking at policies. Procedures will come out of policies. Policies are where we will find things that need to be adjusted, but also standing on um, the ground that we feel that we've started to build and then being as open and transparent with each other as possible. I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm learning from our staff sessions and open conversation. I'm learning to be quiet and sit. And although the, the moments may be long and quiet, something will come forward that will make me realize, oh, actually our whole team doesn't know how decisions are made or our whole team needs to know more about this aspect of our operations. So I think the, the, the question is, yes, we're an institution, but we're an organization that's made up of people. And we all come from different points of view and perspectives and different, uh, bring different areas of expertise. So I, I, I will just speak personally that on behalf of the Henry, on behalf of the institution, my job is to be as open, as vulnerable, and as, um, willing to grow and change with humility and not take things personally. Recognize that this is larger than us and that gives me hope. Okay, another question that has come up is asking uh, what we feel that the role of art and artists can play in societal transformation. Well, that's a big one. I'll try a little bit there. Um, I mean, honestly, I think uh, there are many views on how exactly this happens, but to me, the looking sometimes forcibly, sometimes gently, sometimes surreally, um, the, the insistence on looking at our world in a different way and to think and talk about things that you might not otherwise have thought about in quite that way, whatever it might be, whether it's the animal trials of medieval Europe in Van Bichel or um, the histories of the Black Panthers in Seattle in an exhibition we have up now, whatever element it is that the artist is compelled to communicate, for, for me, it's a transformation of vision, ultimately. And that vision is what changes everything at the end of the day. It has to start there. It has to start with an idea of what it could be or what we could be and move from there. So certainly there is art that is directly activist, directly moved towards policy and political change and which is wonderful and we support as well. But I like to think of art as an overall transformative process if we allow ourselves to engage with it that way. It's a, I'm sorry that that's not more specific, but um, it's a big question. And but I do fundamentally feel that it's that it's expression, creative expression that that creates the change that begins to create the change that we then act on. It doesn't seem that there have been any other questions that have been posed in the Q and A. Oh, we do have one. Um, so following on the previous question, what role is the Henry taking on, can the Henry take on in the way the Seattle community is influencing the nation? Uh, 
Which, I mean, do another you tiny to... question there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, you know, one thing from specifically thinking from the curatorial programmatic arena, some conversations that that we are having, that we have been having already for the years that I've been here, but also, but want to prioritize and really invest in in a greater way, is something Mita was talking about, which is this uh, a deepening of engagement with our communities and our different and the organizations that are working towards social justice in different ways and that they're not serving our purpose but that we're serving theirs and that our engagement is in from that direction and it sounds like a small semantic difference but it isn't it's a, we don't we really want to be unpacking how it is that museums often use this note this idea of engagement as a way to like get people here, but it's it's less of that direction than um, a reaching out for what is needed and what we can do to support those conversations and, and movement. So um, we don't have a precise answer to that exactly, but we have some thoughts about um, transparency of our development with exhibitions and programs and how we can involve uh, a greater portion of the community and from the get-go as opposed to in a reactive way later on, um, more so in a developmental process. So the museum is truly doing what it should be doing, which is serving our public and being a part of it as we go. So. Well, and I think there's a piece of this. How, can you guys hear me okay this time? Great. Uh, I think there's a piece of this that, that kind of co coincides happily with the strategic plan that we put in place last year, which is really thinking about how does the Henry move beyond uh, the the inside of the building in order to interact with greater communities of people and so literally thinking about how the how the art and how the ideas transcend the box was something that we put in place a year ago and of course we're now in a moment of thinking in a much more real sense about what that means so it's uh, it's an excellent challenge but it's it's definitely one that the Henry is taking in stride right now in terms of thinking about how to interact with larger communities uh, within Seattle and, and really across the country. I would add that what, one of the interesting things that, um, that's happened as a result of the pandemic first um, and our remote work is that cohorts are, professional cohorts are in much closer contact with one another than ever before. So the Henry belongs to a, a number of groups. There's a Seattle Museum group. There's, I, I'm a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors. Shamim, I know you're a member of um, Art Museum Curators. And, and as we're all Zooming uh, and talking with each other about our challenges and how we're dealing with things, we're becoming much closer and more tight-knit community. We are sharing a lot more of our uh, challenges, our fears, our concerns, and we're sharing a lot of good ideas because there's no best practice for some of the things that we're up against. We're going to be shaping it and developing it ourselves. So to answer the question of what can the Henry do and, and that will ripple throughout the world from an organizational and a professional practice standpoint, the things that we're trying and doing that we share with our colleagues might be helpful to them. And I know that we're learning from them as well. So I think you've heard from three of us, three different ways in which we're thinking about it, but I'm, I'm grateful for the question. Okay. We have a question um, about uh, our ideas on developing more digital programming and creating visual and media literacy. I, I may be misunderstanding the question, but I'll do my best. And, and uh, the, the person who posed the question, please clarify if I'm not getting at it. Um, you know, one of the things I meant to mention before is that this intense and kind of mind blowing pivot to putting together art and trying to convey art to folks without them ever getting to see it in person has been really, uh, it's been difficult, but it's also been a bit transformative in thinking about how we may continue to uh, to be flexible to offer a kind of array of different ways to engage interact respond and experience the work that we're trying to do and um, making that 
a greater priority in how we program and how we curate and um, thinking about how those things are folded in earlier on. Um, projects that may be able to take place in, in a multiplicity of platforms. Um, you know, one interesting element as well, which is this goes a little bit beyond the question, but um, uh, uh, two of our cur curators are working on inviting artists to develop ways to, to present their work that aren't digital. And so what would that mean in a time where they can't do it in the gallery, they can't do it with a large audience, and what does that look like? And just really trying to think in every possible mode of communication. Um, the digital platforms are amazing, but we also want to keep in mind that that's not accessible to all of our audience. And we want to think in other ways of extending and analog communication and so on. So I, I, there's, <laughs> I don't even like to say it's not a silver lining by any means, but it's when you are pushed, you need to come up with better ways to do things and more expansive ways to do things. And I've been really, really amazed by um, how the team are, do, are doing that. We've begun to do that. And we'll continue to do that ongoing um, in the digital platform. So um, please let me know if you want to be more, want me to be more specific about something, but that was my best <laughs> guess at what you were asking. All right, um, I think Steve, this one will go to you. Um, the role that the board plays in supporting the Henry strategic goals. I'll try unmuting and then try again. Um, I think one of the shifts that we really explored in the implementation of a strategic plan this year was, was having the board and the Henry staff work very collaboratively on what that mission, what the what those goals looked like. And through a series of meetings that were mediated and very interactive between the entire Team Henry, we came up with uh, a set of goals that we agreed on as an organization across the board and staff. Uh, and kind of once that was ratified on the board, it was sent back to Henry staff. And, and then they've really turned that into a series of um, of kind of objectives within each part of the organization that Sylvia could speak to. And in, they in turn have come back to the board and said, uh, in the implementation of this, we see these as the places where we would like your support in terms of executing that. So it's really been this great kind of collaborative back and forth um, that we've explored um, this time, I think much more so than in, in past work on strategic plans. Sylvia, did you want to flush that out? That. I think you did a great job. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Right. Okay, um, we have a question about um, our, once we reopen, um, will it be business as usual or post COVID and Black Lives Matter? Will we need to operate and share art in new ways? Um, and what we, have we learned during this time? I can start with that one. Um, we're still learning. Uh, we have been learning, I would like to, to say, of, but I, we have a lot, we always have more. Um, I, I, I feel that, you know, one of the, we're thinking deeply about, not just about the content of our exhibitions, which has always been top of mind in terms of how we think about diversity and inclusion, but also how they come to be and how they're executed and with whom we execute them. And so that we're talking, beginning our conversations, we don't have final plans to share at this moment, although we'll be happy to do so as we go forward. But we're, we're talking about everything from, as I mentioned, a, a more transparent and inclusive conversation about how we get to the shows that we choose to present in our galleries, how we make them accessible to our audience, both in the galleries themselves, what kinds of interpretation, information, how it's shared, who is supported through those voices of interpretation and, and print presentation in particular, um, which by which I mean literal print, but also in the digital realm information, scholarship and so on. Um, but, it, but everything to, and this is cross-departmental, this isn't just curatorial. I want to be clear that this is a a working conversation across all of our different departments, but who we work with as vendors, who, who are we giving our money to so that we can better have that have influence in 
supporting our community. So, you know, we, we have a, a ongoing meeting set up uh, because of COVID initially um, with our colleagues to figure out how we could better share resources with our organizational colleagues and make things happen out in the world. As Steve mentioned, we're thinking a lot about public presentation, how that might be an, a, an additive way to reach forward and um, be present and address and be responsive, address what's happening currently. Um, and, and are talking about other groups that we could convene um, within our programmatic development as well as our um, exhibition development um, to include and pay attention to the needs and the voices of our greater community. So that's those are just a couple of, of, of examples that are precise, but we're really, we in the curatorial department, I assume in every other department are really trying to take every piece through this lens at this point and think hard about what each thing we do represents about what we believe and where we want it to be, where we want it to be, where it isn't and where we want it to be. So, I mean, there's so much to say about that, but I, as a beginning that that's where I would start. I think it's fair to say that there is not gonna, I, I can't envision ever. I don't even know what business as usual is um, right now. And I certainly know that we're not going back to the way things were in so many ways, operationally, functionally, in terms of um, even that just the way we're talking with each other as colleagues and, and partners in the stewardship of this organization. We, the Henry is over 95 years old. We did not build it. Uh, we are chosen and fortunate enough to be able to uh, steer it and steward it for a period of time. And that's an incredible responsibility and it's a pleasure and a privilege. So uh, we take it really seriously and we'll look at everything from what dots on the floor are gonna ensure social distancing to um, how, what kind of language we're using to communicate with our people to ensure that we're as open and inclusive as possible. All right, the next question is about um, uh, how we envision bridging the gap between board and staff to create a better understanding of the board's role at the Henry and to promote conversations across all levels of the institution. That's a great question. I actually, I just want to say how much I enjoy, I feel like we get more interaction um, with this online meeting than we do in our typical meeting. So as much as I dislike the technology between us, I'm appreciating that. So thank you for that question. Um, I think this is a, it's a really uh, an important question and, and something that we're putting more thought behind now. We've traditionally kind of seen the board and staff as somewhat separate, um, seen the roles as a little bit isolated and really relied on uh, kind of the Henry executive staff to form a bridge between the two bodies within the organization. I think a few years ago, we began to recognize the need for uh, greater connection. And I would say that we've had some success with that. Um, with a tiny bit of awkwardness. I think we're always trying to be both respectful of the time that people, that board members are spending and the time that staff is spending and some of the ways that are obvious to bring people together are really just asking people to commit more time. So one of the places that we're beginning to explore uh, for the year ahead is thinking about how to place board members within staff um, conversations and groups and vice versa so that the work that's being done across the organization is really being both understood and implemented and facilitated on both sides of, um, you know, from board to staff. And I think that's something that I'd be really open to suggestions about and very curious to see how we can develop that as something going forward. I also just want to flag that we are at 6 p.m. I think we've got some time to uh, continue if there are more questions, but um, I want to be respectful as well. You said, do we have one more question left or how? We do, yeah, we have a question about online platforms. Um, so do we see continuing using online platforms like Zoom for public programming and meetings like this even after the museum is open to the public? I mean, I can answer that quickly. Um, we envision that there's going to be quite a period of time where we're not gonna all, even if the museum is open to the public, we're not all gonna be back there for the safety of our own team, we need to minimize that presence as well. So there'll be remote, so from the work side, 
for sure that will maintain. From the side of public programming, yes, again, um, we have been discovering a lot of what the online platforms can do for us. And granted, right now we're forced into them entirely, but hopefully going forward, we'll be able to think about this will have different kinds of functionality across different platforms and embrace all of those different ways to communicate um, to, di to audiences, bring people in, let them experience it. Just one very simple example, um, it, or straightforward, I should say, not simple, um, is a program that we have around our collection called Reframe, where um, items from the collection are brought together under a theme. And initially, it was uh, everyone met at the Henry in our wonderful study center um, to have some access very directly to work. The intention was intimate conversation, uh, people participating that way. Of course, that became impossible um, in March, but it moved to online and has um, generated an extraordinary uh, amount of interest and participation for people around the world, which has really changed the conversation, the input, um, and again, it enhanced that intimacy of engagement with the art and our uh, curator of collections and the rest of the group, whoever it might be. So that's one thing for that we're certain we'll continue to do. We'll probably offer it both on-site and digitally um, as we go forward. Um, there are many, many other uh, uh, examples of that, but just to give one for the moment. Well, we are at our time. And did we get through the questions, Jisook? Yes? OK. OK. Um, I just want to say we miss you. I think we really do. I can't see all of you, but um, I feel you. I feel the energy. I'm grateful for the time. Uh, we can't wait to welcome you back to the Henry. Thank you for joining us today. And we wish you peace and wellness. Thank you for being with us. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you again. Have a great evening.